So has modern technology made men obsolete? That will be the question we're looking at today on the CMAS Christian Masculinism Podcast. I'm your host this week, Dr. Michael Robillard, former U.S. Army officer and ex-Oxford philosopher. With me today is the usual CMAS crew. We have Catholic strongman Elliot Hulse, making men strong both physically and spiritually around the world. Will Nolan, former Eden literature instructor who was fired from Eden after his controversial online lecture on patriarchy. And Timothy Gordon, host of Rules for Retrogrades, co-author with yours truly of the book Don't Go to College, and also the author of the book The Case for Patriarchy. Welcome back, y'all. How is everybody doing today? All is well. Good, Mike. Good to be here, man. Awesome, awesome. Good to see you guys as well. All right, so let's get right into it. So in 1968, radical feminist Valerie Solanas shot famous postmodern artist Andy Warhol. That same year, she wrote the Scum Manifesto, short for the Society for Cutting Up Men, which urged women to, quote, overthrow the government, eliminate the money system, institute complete automation, and eliminate the male sex. Her argument, essentially, was that since modern technology, particularly in the form of sperm banks, in vitro fertilization, and automation, can arguably outperform men in their procreative, productive, and protective capacities, human males were now at best redundant and obsolete, or at worst unjustly oppressive and needed to be gotten rid of. Thoughts? I got to jump in there because I had a gut reaction because it seems to me that actually women are being replaced. Sex robots mm. uh, don't talk back. And there's a whole market of men that are spending thousands of dollars on these flesh-like dolls that will only make the sounds that he wants to hear. That plus, it seems like Petri dish babies are on the rise. And so they're looking for ways to reproduce us without the maternal womb so you know it's kind of a a stab at men but it's as feminism always is a stab a stab at humankind mankind i mean the the specific difference of a human being is that property which separates our species from our genus according to thomas aguinas and we are animals this upsets some uh, Calvinists and some some Puritan Catholics, but we are animals. We're the one rational animal. That means we're the one animal with an immortal soul. And so the specific difference of any human being, man or woman, is that we're rational. And the rational capacity of AI has always been the, the one area that it's, you know, rational in scare quotes, that it's less than human ability to calculate is in pattern recognition. It's what set AI back all those years when we were hearing about it. It was allegedly going to come out and take the world by storm in the 90s. Still, a human being can recognize a pattern faster than a computer, which is why if you play peekaboo with the baby, they know what you're doing the second or the third time and they start laughing. Uh, machines can't do this, even though they can perform calculations infinitely faster than us. Um, hu- human males have that. That means the most, as a distinction of degree, unique, uniquely high on average pattern recognition in the world. And of course, human females have a higher pattern recognition than machines as well. We will not be replaced, uh, men or women. I, I can allay Elliot's fears as well. Men and women are irreplaceable. We have irrational soul, uh, rational souls, and we also have wills that are uh, work in tandem with our intellects that cannot be replaced. And it's just a it's a matter of fact. It's a matter of species and genus. It's a boring answer, I guess. There's a novel by Charlotte Perkins Gilman um, called Herland, and it's a weird thing that female sci-fi writers will often write about fictional worlds with no men in, but you don't really get men writing fictional worlds without women in. It's a funny asymmetry. Anyway, even in this novel she sets up based in her land where they can bring about miraculous births without men, conveniently, there are no 
big predatory animals and no kind of natural disasters either like earthquakes fires etc so she's made careful to eliminate the danger in the environment so i think that's a nod to not just the procreative uh, potential of men but also the protective potential of men as well being irreplaceable there's mm -hmm. a fragility to the female even despite technology right right so will pass good will did she also in her uh phantasmagoria of this imagined universe did she also eliminate all cattiness because <laughs> when no i mean i asked because women hate hanging out with other women by and large they they the only time they really want to hang out and have a good time and and let their hair down you mentioned fragility there's also this major problem of frigidity and around a man that a woman trusts frigidity is at its all-time low uh and we we call this cattiness but women do not know how to be submissive even in an ordinary way in settings around other women that men do around other men just to quote unquote be cool they do around men that they love and respect so this would be uh hell on earth and unless there was some mechanism within the plot that gets rid of the frigidity which leads to female cattiness when they're hanging out shopping for the afternoon they're not going to enjoy this manless environment very much in addition to all the other factors you guys named yeah, I hadn't thought of that one. That's another way in which it's fantasy rather than reality. Yep. Good call. So in earlier episodes, uh, we've talked about the some of the pernicious side effects with respect to technological developments, particularly in the areas of industrialization. I know Elliot uh, mentioned that uh, at length at one episode and uh, birth control. So can we talk a bit maybe about how we are to make sense of of those technologies and, and the world that we're in post industrialization and post birth control. Hmm. We, we talked a bit about the, the earlier content. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, I was going to ask, are you suggesting uh, that the technology of birth control uh, as a, as a topic of conversation, Meaning like, so is that going to be the end of man? Our, in, our, our ability to curb our reproduction. And then of course the, uh, the narrative that we are somehow evil to the planet um, as a means of technology taking us, taking us down. Yeah, yeah. Is this, you know, what, what are our thoughts on how these things are both affecting men and families and and then what you know what, what ought to be our response to that yeah i would just uh just ha hang on that idea that uh birth control for it to be what it is there has to be a narrative well not of just pleasure uh and you know uh, the 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 uh degeneracy of our culture and our behavior but also that having children is somehow bad making babies is somehow irresponsible uh, especially for white people if you're mm -hmm. racist if you make white babies um so yeah for sure for us to uh to have taken this hook line and sinker and then to give up or to give in to our natural instinct and the god-given responsibility to reproduce is an affront to uh mankind humankind and uh, what we're uh, designed to be mm -hmm. i mean there's yeah, a yeah, go ahead, Will. Sorry. I was just going to say that the uh, the pill flatlines female attraction to masculinity. So normally in a naturally cycling woman, then around the time of peak ovulation, the more masculine traits become more attractive. But there's lots of studies showing that with the pill, what you get is no peak attraction. So the kind of men that become more attractive to women are in general, more feminine, and then male behavior shifts towards being more feminine because the kind of dominance, assertion, et cetera, that normally with a, a naturally cycling woman would be a turn on, actually becomes a, a turn off. It's perceived as aggressive. So men shift to more feminine in their behavior. And then that affects what biologists would call like the overall um, fitness score of the species going downhill as well. Because if you look at the 1960s with the pill coming in, around two decades later, 
what do the male pop stars look like? They got makeup, <laughs> they got long hair, they were in lycra, they're in high heels, they're screeching like women. And these are the new stars that all the women are looking up to. And there's that little lag between the pill coming in and then that being the new version of manhood that everyone wants. Mm -hmm. And you filter that down across the decades and the two are related, like the effeminization of men and birth control are linked. But like Elliot said, if you throw away your duty as a man to reproduce and the fact that that sexual pleasure comes with responsibility, if you want to sever the two, then you're going to get the consequences. Yeah, I, my point dovetails nicely with Wales. Sidava does. I, I think um, it, it, buried in all that, you have the philosophy nerd would would bring out two dichotomies, and they're both dichotomies, um, comparisons against nature. One is phusis, which is the Greek word meaning nature, phusis versus techne, and its correlation with another one, phusis versus nomos, which is convention technes technology and and essentially what you see i was going to make this point before well made it so it's it's easy to make now is after the 1960s and contraception came in contraception plus in the form of the pill not just condoms the technology of having uh some sort of blockage to conception contraception this created a new anti-nature uh, nomos or a set of conventions or, or, or false culture. Whereas before men and women are attracted to uh, fecundity in one another and marks indicia of fecundity. Now it seems to be the opposite. Well, well uh, enumerated exactly how, and this all culminates with bitch ass soy face, right? That you see <laughs> all over the internet, soy face guys going, and the mouth is always open there's something Freudian there. I, I won't say what, but there's, yeah, I mean, this is three decades after the eighties when you had stuff like, you know, uh, take your pick of, of eighties bands wearing spandex and eyeliner. But the point is Fusus versus techne means that nature is in some way opposed to, to one thing, technology in a unique way. And, you know, Heidegger says technology alienates us from being, he means nature qua nature. And this is true. And it's proven by the false culture that's created by technology, which is, um, you wouldn't think it's possible otherwise to be attracted to an opposite kind of thing just because our own technology has begun to lead to a, a a false sort of enshrinement of false culture, but it does. It actually makes you human beings, men attracted to less fertile women, women attracted to less fertile men. You'd think that's really, that's really powerful. How could technology interfere with nature so much? Well, somehow it does. And five decades later, you have something called soy face on the internet with uh, most YouTubers making their videos this way. Right. Right. So Padre Pio uh, famously, when once asked by Joe Peterson, he said that the man who invented refrigeration went to heaven, the man who invented television, and quote, then he pointed downward. So Padre Pio was very anti pro refrigeration, but anti television. And then you have that William F. Buckley quote that Tim has mentioned before that the, the car is the mechanical Jacobin. So we look at these these two instances within 20th century technology of, of Catholic thought, and we've also talked about industrialization, and we've talked about the advent of the pill. Now we're post-internet, post-web 2.0, social media, smartphones. In general, is it is it the case that men are just more and more being effeminized and cucked by technology as such? And furthermore, is patriarchy and technological progress fundamentally incompatible? Is it just getting worse and worse? Probably. I mean, there's no way to say because we don't have the the con position. So we can't say with like apodictic conscience certi certitude. But yeah, probably. I mean, this seems to be the trend. If we're reading the correlations right, 
in just using our common sense straight. This seems to be the case, even even without feminists coming up with little little um, fantasy novels where cat ladies aren't weird because there are no men to call them weird or whatever, whatever Will was talking about. And even without without uh, feminists having this fantasy, I think it, it's foreseeable that when mankind, I mean, not to to beat Fusus versus Techne, but when mankind comes up with a tool that unlike other tools which perform one they have teleologically speaking they have one ergon one function or, you know a wrench really only does this or it does that you could go the other way if you want to undo what you just did but it's got one function technology is a unique tool that is made to spawn more and more functionality that's that's what we're talking about here that's what ai is and so Whereas man looks to give himself a mechanical advantage, you know, when he's building a bench that he doesn't want to have. You don't want a mechanical advantage when you're doing bench press, right? This, you don't want a pulley machine. You want to actually be lifting the weights yourself. He doesn't want to replace himself via some sort of infinite increasing mechanical advantage when it comes to what does it take to be a good man? What does it take to fulfill my job here? Uh, the tools don't end up helping you. You end up helping the tool. The things you own end up owning you, like uh, Tyler Durden says in Fight Club. So I think it's according to script that if you build, if you as a man accept tools that increase their usage, you know, like, like the expanding lives and a half-life, radioactively which is what ai is then you're just admitting you're being more and more replaced in your virility i don't really think this is even interpretive i think this is according to the quiddity of what ai intelligibly is yeah the decrease in virility as well goes hand in hand with an aversion to asceticism i was looking at what some other catholic thinkers have written on this topic and came across this line in J.H. Randall, Religion in the Modern World. And he writes that the long centuries that preached renunciation and spirituality have been forgotten with the golden flood pouring from the machine and trickling down to all who traffic with it. Asceticism in any form, either medieval otherworldliness or this worldly abstinence from pleasure and far-seeing thrift of the Puritan, seems both futile and wrong. So something about the nature of industrialization is opposed to Christian ethics because it's about maximum production, maximum satisfaction, and any kind of asceticism is just poison to that. And with it comes a weakening of men because they're always seeking comfort. I would add that the uh, the effect on our physiology is so damaging in that when we engage in say video game activity or pornography that stimulates our eyes but does not actually give us a uh, the physical gratification through the muscular system the sensory organs but emotionally and uh and hormonally so you here you have it's almost like if you have your playing a video game or watching pornography or engaging in a virtual world uh, is, is, is akin to having one foot on the brake and one foot on the gas when you're trying to drive a car. You've got this internal revving because of what's going on in terms of the visual and auditory stimulation, but at the same time, you don't get the physical uh, expression or the physical release that will be associated with an actual activity. So, the, you know, amongst many of the things that we're struggling with is the imaginary world or almost mm -hmm. almost like uh, what do they call it when we are like half human, half uh, robot, half technology. Cyborg. Hmm? Cyborg. Cyborg. Yeah, yeah. We're, <laughs> we're, we're like uh, literally becoming cyborgs, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is um the. the, the was the next question I was going to move on to was that uh, the e Elon Musk has a quote. We said we're already part cyborg. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, 
it's uh i think a an apt description of, i guess where we are i mean one anyone look looking at this might think that the the theme of this podcast might be somewhat hypocritical or, or contradictory right i mean we're, we're talking <laughs> talking to one another over video to a, a an audience uh that mm -hmm. isn't in the same physical space that we are so and we were talking about the chat gbt ai and perhaps the benefits of that 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 could help with respect to uh communicating and um getting out christian content catholic content so i mean is the to play devil's advocate the other way are there some elements of modern technology and 21st century technology that we can look at as being uh as um uh, borgman albert borgman refers to as appropriate technology right so is there appropriate technology that we can we can find amongst this otherwise technological dystopia that we're we're uh heading towards yeah for sure uh, technology itself is just an expression of the fact that we're rational like badgers and pigs mm. didn't invent wi-fi like they, they can't do it mm. um only human beings can and for the reasons that tim outlined that we have the spiritual powers of will and intellect so technology is a sign of the fact that we are rational but it can be used in a way that is contrary to natural law like the pill for example whereas viagra which other animals haven't invented isn't contrary to natural law because it actually helps the completion of the sexual act if a guy's impotent and he has viagra then it can actually help the natural end be achieved whereas the pill goes against it mm. so there's all kinds of technology that's great like if you break your leg you can get operations that aren't mm. you know possible in nature that a, a <laughs> tiger if it broke broke its leg he wouldn't get mm. but that doesn't mean it's contrary to natural law right right yeah, it's part of the natural law uh, I think there is something to <clears throat> appropriate technology. I'll have to think of this later, but it, it tends to be one of the technologies that is single serving. I, I'm full of Tyler Durdenisms today, but single serving technology. I mean, one telos, one ergon being functional, being operative by the, the turning of a screw with a screwdriver or the, the pull of a wrench. Uh, the technologies that collocate a whole bunch of functionalism, I mean, we're, we're, that's partly what we're doing right now in front of screens, but they seem to be the dangerous ones because they beget more technology and more function replacement in man. They give us less to do. I mean, there's a, I think, season nine Simpsons episode where Mar the Simpsons moved to like a technological household and marge has nothing to do around the house with classic uh you know homekeeper housemaker whatever it's called homemaker and she starts she starts drinking a glass and a half of wine a day and there's like dark music that comes up because she has nothing to do the robots vacuuming the floor and the dishwasher is automatic so there's a sense of utility that's sure to follow on technologies that uh take too much of what we're here to do and i think that's that's the basic distinction appropriate technology doesn't necessarily even take the full job away from us it just uh, and it gives us a mechanical advantage in one aspect of the job mm -hmm. yeah that's i just add simply that it's the it was what used to make of the technology i suppose right like i could use a hammer to bludgeon someone to death um <laughs> but to use this as a means by which I was catechized as a Catholic uh, is uh, uplifting. I think it's sort of a combination of things, right? Like, so our post-liberalism modernist world uh, coupled with the increased technology is sort of like open the floodgates for all kinds of wrong ways to use cool new stuff. Mm -hmm. Like just imagine, and I'm just kind of playing scruples here. Uh, you know, if the technology was used in a way that had boundaries and that was released in a world that considered boundaries and was used to glorify the Lord and to mm -hmm. make us all saints and to spread the gospel as opposed to, you know, more porn and degeneracy. So it's the environment in which the technology has been unleashed, I suppose. Mm -hmm. 
any thoughts on that, Will? Just combining something that Tim and Elliot both hinted at there, if you're using technology to try to minimize labor or even ideally reduce it, that's a bad thing. Um, Pope Pius XI had a great line that man is born to labor as the bird to fly. Mm. So we need work. We're supposed to have hardship. It was one of the punishments meted out in justice after the fall. And even in Eden, before the fall, there was some kind of work going on for Adam, but it wasn't as painful, obviously, as afterwards. So we need it psychologically. We need it physically as well, which is why if you talk to any guy, how does it feel after you've done a workout? How does it feel after you've been working in your garden? How does it feel building something? It's one of the quickest ways to alleviate male depression, even more effective than talking therapies. Even secular doctors acknowledge that. So labor is a good thing. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, just commenting on that point and Tim's point. You guys ever seen the Pixar movie Wally? See what I'm talking about. You I just one. watched it. I just yeah. watched it because of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, the 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 opening scene of it. Yeah, it shows you know the the atrophied bodies and atrophied. Like nature of of the the like like adult babies that the the technology is it's just rendered them um infantile and 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 bored and depressed and listless and you know they, they just they're shells of what they could be in part because yeah there's no pressure there's no there's no labor by which they can experience their own agency uh you know and they're they're just stimulating themselves into oblivion uh so yeah, yeah this- i think Yep. That movie's uh 100% previous to the body positivity movement, right? There's nothing well, there's, it's, there's nothing it's super, positive about it. Super being, based. It's the yeah, most it's based like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everyone's Surprising. a badass and they're depressed. Yeah, yeah and they're they're depressed and and yeah, the 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 salvation is them coming back to earth and and rolling their sleeves up and doing physical labor to fix it as opposed to resorting to more more convenient technology and, and leaving it for somebody else. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a great movie. I'd suggest it to, to anybody. Um, but yeah, I meant just, to tell you, I I just watched it because of you. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I reference it a lot. Um, all right, great. Uh, so yeah, getting back to that Musk quote, you know, you have Musk saying, you know, we're we're already part cyborg, and then you have you know these these like hyper transhumanist utopians like a Ray Kurzweil. That you know, Tim and I write about this a bit in our Don't Go to College book. Where what they're selling people is this narrative of it's just tech, we're heading towards technological utopia of merging our consciousness with AI and robotics and, um, you know, bi- bio enhancement. And this this is the new utopia. This is the secular heaven that we're heading towards. I find that exceptionally creepy and dehumanizing. It seems like it's not an enhancement of humanity. It's the uh, annihilation of humanity. Is Ray Kurzweil right. the the unicity guy or whatever it's called? Singularity is near. Singularity, yeah. that's right. Yes. Sorry, yeah. sorry, Ellie. Yeah, I remember him. So I, yeah, mean, I was if, just going to say, yeah. you know, the technocracy uh, is like a control grid. And so it, mm-hmm. it is scary given that, you know, we take all these conveniences for granted uh, that, you know, my heart rate or my blood sugar or uh, the contents of the biosphere in my stomach can all just be uploaded to a cloud. Mm. Uh, Every aspect of my being, every private thought that I have that I interject into this screen that I carry around with me, uh, millions of hours of my likeness and image, which can be reproduced, even Mm. my voice, all just loaded up into a cloud every step i take everywhere i go basically my thoughts are projected like i said into the screen but even more so they reflect them back to me through the ads that kind of already know what i want to buy before i even said i want to mm-hmm. buy it uh mm-hmm. is 100 totally a uh, new world order control grid uh system that just locks us into a um you know, into in, in this control money. Think about the money too. It was a time they're totally getting rid of 
paper currency. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. now my daughter was asking this yesterday. I teased her because she's been making me uh, YouTube videos on my strength camp channel. She's filming my workout. She's doing a great job. And I pay her 50 bucks a video. And uh, so yesterday I joked. I was like, oh, you're going to have to pay taxes. And she's like, because I pay her through Venmo. She doesn't know this. She says, uh, how are they going to know? Don't tell them. Don't tell the IRS. <laughs> so I don't have to pay taxes. <laughs> you know, she's made like a thousand bucks already. So it's over 600 bucks. You're going to have to pay some taxes. And uh, she's like, how do they know? I was like, babe, every dollar you received came through a wire, came through digital. And so somebody sees it. And if anybody wants it, they can go and look and they can come knock on the door and ask for their money back. How? It's adorable, isn't it? The uh, the innocence of youth. How is the IRS going to know? Like they're every move you make, every step you take, they are watching you. Uh, they are Ray Kurzweil, right? So uh, I love uh, the, the sweetness of you. Yeah, I was trying to explain the IRS to my 11 year old like a few months ago, and it was the same deal. She's like, I, I don't get it. How do they know who you pay? I was explaining to her that I do pay her three bucks for a chore. And uh, maybe we pay taxes on that IRS, but it's it's adorable. <laughs> oh, yeah. Paper currency, though, since since no one's jumped. Uh, did you know mm-hmm. banks are actually uh, in preparation for Agenda 2030? They're self uh, uh, uprooting and they're they're pulling up branches in major civic centers and they're pulling up ATMs in major civic centers to force more paperless currency it's very scary i did not know that but that sounds right on plan <laughs> that's what i would do if i were them yeah that's, uh... what are you guys thoughts on crypto like you know i'm not very well versed but it just smells like more of the same control stuff to me uh if it's in a cloud if it's intangible it's easily manipulatable mm-hmm, this mm-hmm. is the whole uh federal reserve system yeah the- yeah the yeah. good the advocates claim that it's not. The advocates claim that crypto has largely failed because uh, the, the the you know one worlders hated it so much. I don't know. I I, I tend to re- regard it as you do, Elliot. I'm like, well, that's might be adverse manipulation, but it's still manipulatable in a way that that tangible currency is not. I I, I tend right. to agree with you, as I tend to. So the um. I guess the the transhumanism point as this relates though that I keep thinking is that you know is is that an inevitability that we're heading towards if we're if we don't actively dig our heels in in some quasi luddism quasi agrarian quasi Amish way to to prevent this runaway towards the Ray Kurzweil W E F transhumanist uh you know grid that that um Elliot was mentioning, you know, like is is there a other bulwarks or, or practical methods, practical things we can do to prevent that direction of travel if we find that it's pernicious? I don't think any of it's inevitable. None of this stuff ever is. But if you make comfort your top priority, mm. then they're going to use that against you and kill you with it. So you got the choice between the cross and comfort, as you do in everything. And there'll be lots of kind of difficulties and sacrifices you have to make to be able to live outside what system ideally they want to impose on you. But if you end up inside it, in the uh, the metaverse with a VR headset, streaming porn, and you're just having orgasms all day, and then you call that your best life, and what have you got to blame except yourself? You You wanted it. And now you can't buy things. They can switch off your money at the push of a button. They can switch your car off as well. They Mm. can even take away your VR headset whenever they want. That's the trade-off you get, isn't it? Mm. Well, as a pushback to all of the technocracy, I would remind folks that Christianity is, is not like the way for holy people or something. It's the only way. And even to Christians that are listening, Catholics that are listening in, in particular, we we think of three modes of Christianity as the way the pagans think of all Christianity is, oh, that's add extra. You go in and you say, no, Christianity is the only way, the, the way to the father, the way to life. 
But then you, okay, so say we're all Christians and we're addressing a Christian audience. Well, they make the same mistake and they think of these three modes of Christianity as add extra forms of Christianity. They're not. Uh, the three M's, my friend Joseph Polizotto is always hitting this point hard. Martyrdom, mysticism, and monasticism. These are not three special modes of Christian. There's a there's a red form and a white form. And we think, well, not everyone becomes a red martyr, but we're all called to be white martyrs. That means we Christians, we can't compromise with the world. I'm not just talking about the technological, uh, pornological world. I'm talking about we're not allowed to make compromises. Well, you know, our king, we bow to our king and our king only. And this has always set us against the state. But, but with uh, mysticism and monasticism as well, we're we're called to be monks and mystics in our prayer lives in, in, in radically different ways. That you would basically say um, opposite ways. I mean, the, the monks, we mean you, you starve yourself. You're not obsessed with co comfort, like Will said. And mystics... We're called to see the the sign of the times, to to be able to read the sign of the times, and we're we're called to do so through a kind of special prayer discernment. So it's dangerous, very very dangerous, when a secular guy says, "Well, you know, I, I want to live in the the virtual universe, but I'm not a Christian. My Christian neighbor over here, he's a pretty good guy, you know, and he he might be more square with the Lord than I am, assuming that the guy speaking isn't a total atheist. Christianity isn't a heightened form of life. It's the only form of life. Similarly, martyrdom, mysticism, monasticism are not heightened forms of Christianity. They are the way. Like, this is the way. And technology, if it stands in the way, this, this negative technology or, or you know, multi-serving technology that distracts us uh, on our path, uh, threatens to lead us away, Instead of good technology, appropriate technology, which helps us to to hump the trail even even more assiduously, um, then we we ought to just ignore it. I don't even think this is luddism, and I, I don't I don't necessarily agree that the television or video games are always bad if you govern that stuff well. Uh, I mean, I play play video games with my kids at night, that and my wife. That's what we all do together, but. No, it's, it's so. So what I'm saying is, even within the bounded function of one given technology, it's not univocally bad or good. You could there could be a bad use of video games. They get a bad rap because ninety percent of the young men who use them are porn users, probably more than that, and use them inappropriately. But if you're using them at the end of the day with your family, some of these technologies could go either way. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. On uh, Tim's point with regard to martyrdom, it's interesting because, you know, as as threatening as that may be to be a part of this control grid, it's almost uh, it's fake in that the martyrdom of today is the cutting off of your access to the digital playground. Mm, mm -hmm. And so, you know, we had this new um, bill that passed with regard to gay marriage that says that you are against it's against the law to not serve someone in a way that you want. Well, that's generally going to be Christians that are going to oppose, uh, as opposed to the red martyrdom, yeah, as, as was described uh, by Timothy. Um, I would imagine that we at some point will be forced to set ourselves apart at a certain point. Enough, you know, digital martyrs will, uh, will proliferate. And I, I would just, I could only imagine that the rest of us at some point are going to say, well, I guess we're off now. And so it's just a matter of getting off of the devil's playground, setting ourselves apart and therefore maintaining that sovereignty that God intended us to have um, because we're forced to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very really good point. Like r running to the sound of the guns in this day and age is like the, the on Twitter you know going going over the trench hill is yep yeah, saying something controversial that could <laughs> could get you get all your channels demonetized and then you're not eating so yeah right it's a big thing to let sink in that the church has never taught that mere mechanical or technological progress is the same thing as civilization 
Like the two aren't identical. Mm. Mm. But if you look around at the way most people behave and say, what do you mean the modern world's got a problem? We've got iPhones. Look at all this cool stuff. Mm. Well, that's not civilization. Like I normally use the image of Bluetooth dildos. Like it doesn't matter that you have a Bluetooth dildo. It doesn't yeah. mean it's a good civilization. Some would even say that that by itself is kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really, really, really important distinction. Yeah, the people, um, yeah, they'll just say, oh, what, you know, don't you like antibiotics? You know, what, do you, do you want to start sawing limbs off if, uh, if you, know, you get an infection? No? Okay, well, then, then you know, obviously all technology. Bluetooth dildos. Then yeah, Bluetooth but, yeah then, then, then Bluetooth dildos it is. It's, it's like, one uh, or yeah. the other. Take your uh, pick, yeah. bro. <laughs> yeah. Take your pick now. Saw right, your right. limb off or you have a Bluetooth dildo in your Yeah, head. yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's just, those, those are the options. Yeah. Um, yeah. The big yeah, point is I, in the dark ages, there were no pregnant men. And <laughs> you want to call that a, a worse civilization yeah, because we've yeah. got pregnant men now? Yep. No, yeah. Yeah, exactly. The, um, yeah, so that's a very, very good distinction between yeah, civilizational progress versus technological pro progress, so to speak. So within the Muslim tradition, you know, you, you will find uh, sex of... Um, Islam that will argue about uh, prohibition against any type of innovation, right? So innovation with respect to their um, practices, but also innovation with respect to technology. Um, you know, this is sort of where the um, uh, Taliban and the Wahhabists were uh, uh, getting their ideas from. Deodorant. That's Deodorant, the technology. Yeah. Technology. So very, I'm very I, I don't know this in particular. This is the question that I have for for um, either any of you guys. Is is there anything within Catholic catechesis that explicitly like is it says something about technology? You know that we or either explicitly or like derivatively that we can we can point to. Is there anything comparable? Yeah, that I think there is actually. Um, I think there's this. I think in the ninety four catechism, I think there is something. If someone does the talky talk while I look, I, I think I can try to go find it. Right. Aquinas talks about the right application of reason to the things to be made, which I guess implies a lot about the way in which technology is to be used, mm. which we've covered already. And I was looking for something unpacking the relationship between technology and his social teaching. Mm -hmm. And the best I've found is from this guy, Eric Gill. And he says that either private ownership for the sake of the work to be done must be reestablished or deliberately surrendering men's imminent and proprietary right to imprint on matter, the mark of rational being turning away in consequence from the Christian society in which there shall be private ownership for the sake of public use. We must accept communistic industrialism and look forward to the leisure state. And he's using the leisure state scathingly there. Mm. So I guess that's an answer to Marx's big point about uh, whether we can actually reconcile the modern methods of production with private property. Mm. Marx says, no, you can't. And you've just got to get uh, ownership in common. But that's a big problem because the family and private property go together. And then Gill's responding to that, thinking about what kind of compromise is to be made between the two. What was the name of that guy again? Eric Gill. Eric Gill. So he, I think he's saying, like, look, if, if you go down this route, then you're going to get that full-scale communistic industrialism and then the leisure state. Mm -hmm. you find that quote tim yeah i found a few of them it's uh paragraphs 2292 2293 2294 it's all pretty good stuff 90 uh 92 is pretty brief scientific medical or psychological experiments on human individuals or groups can contribute to healing the sick and advancement of public health uh 2293 the caveat 
basic scientific research as well as a pro applied research is a significant expression of man's dominion over creation, which is an important point that we mm -hmm. remember the technologists, all the, the lib transhumanist guy, they're always yeah. emphasizing the opposite <laughs> point that man does not have a dominion over creation, which is all, which is counterintuitive because they're saying like, Hey, they're making a more ambitious claim than the church is making here. The church is saying man has dominion over creation, but we should not try to alter our nature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, they're saying, no, we can alter our nature, but it's not dominion over creation. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting dishonesty at the heart of this. Uh, 2293 continues, science and technology are precious resources. This is well stated. When placed at the service of man and promote his integral development for the benefit of all. By themselves, however, they cannot disclose the meaning of existence and of human progress. Science and technology are ordered to man from whom they take their origin and development. Hence, they find in the person and in his moral values, both evidence of their purpose and awareness of their limits. 2294 says it is an illusion to claim moral neutrality in scientific research and its applications, which is at the heart of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, guiding principles cannot be in inferred from simple technical efficiency or from the usefulness accruing to some at the expense of others or even worse from prevailing ideologies. Science and technology by the very nature require unconditional respect for fundamental moral criteria. They must be at the service of the human person, of his inalienable rights, of his true and integral good in conformity with the plan and the uh, will of God. So this is what we've been really articulating throughout most of this show. I'd also add a couple good quotes. See, this one's from Solzhenitsyn. He said, all, all hope cannot be pinned on science, technology, and economic growth. The victory of technological civilization has instilled in us a spiritual insecurity. Its gifts but enrich, but enslave as well. I would take the, the last quote I'm going to read from Max Planck, a uh, quantum physicist, as the goal or the, the dividing line between the good and the bad. He says, it is the steady, ongoing, never slackening fight against skepticism and dogmatism, against unbelief and superstition, which religion and science wage together. The directing watchword in this struggle runs from the remotest past to the distant future, on to God. That, that's a good a good nice. watchword. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Thank you for those. That's super helpful. Yeah. Sure. Nice. So I, I figured just as we're wrapping up the hour, you know, because this is not just talking about technology with respect to Christianity, but technology with respect to Christian men. Uh, maybe we can finish with last thoughts on just uh, maybe some prescriptions, some pragmatic thoughts as Christian men in the 21st century as to, you know, what we could get our audience for, you know, some some rules of thumb or just ideas, prescriptions going forward to to not get corrupted by the, the technology and to, to use it wisely and, and appropriately. For, for men in particular? Well, uh, you know, mortifying the flesh is a means by which we become more manly men, right? Doing things that are tough. And I remember Father Ripperger talking about how we get a pleasure out of technology. And so there's an effeminacy associated mm. with using tools. And so, you know, we've got at our disposal, at our disposal these tools of technology um, and they give us a pleasure. So as with fasting from food, uh, fasting from dopamine uh, hits, uh, taking a break and creating a boundary in your life on uh, those things that bring you pleasure, uh, I would imagine treat it no differently. We have Lent coming up here. And so it may be one of the things that you choose to do, which is to delete all the apps on your phone or stay away from or keep your phone plugged into the wall and not carry it with you everywhere you go. Or just find some way to create a distance between that which is basically becoming integrated into our biology uh, so that we can get to know ourselves without it. And that just means practice. Mm -hmm. nice. I think a skeptic would look at what I what I do a lot of times on Wednesdays and Fridays and think, uh, Tim, you're, you're confused about technology. This, this is... Uh, a sort of response to something Elliot said. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm agreeing with what he's saying, but res responding out of the mouth of a supposed critic, like what I do on Wednesdays and Fridays is uh, all throughout the year, not just Lent, is black fasting. And that means, you know, I don't eat food till three on Wednesdays or Fridays. Uh, then typically on those days, because most of the family's already eaten, I get in the car and very efficiently 
you know, go go and pick something up, go get a Subway sandwich or something on those days because most of the family's eaten. So what I'm doing, I mean, we think about it. In one way, I'm mortifying the flesh willfully, intentionally not eating food that we have around the house for the first seven or six hours of the day. But on the other hand, it's like, okay, I'm going to use technology hyper efficiently to get me right at three or to, you know, the subway down down the road instead of mortifying my flesh and and uh, walking on top of fasting. And, you know, William F. Buckley might have might think I'm giving into Jacobinism by by taking the car. I, I'm really am not. And what I'm suggesting by all this is you can mortify the flesh in surgical ways that you really this would be good. You know, to fast. Fasting is really good. It's really, really a spike to your prayer life. And I, I encourage all men to fast. But then you can use surgically technology like your mechanic. You can get inside your mechanical Jacobin and go end your fast whenever you set out to do so. And it just it shows that I think more technology is in the gray space than good technology, bad technology. I think I think, like I said, video games are a good uh, instantiation of the principle. Like we tend to talk about all of uh, on Catholic Twitter, especially a given technology is taken univocally. People will say, and I understand why they'll say Netflix. Oh, that always means bad. Well, of course it's an evil company, but it's not so evil that, that we uh, formally cooperate it when we use their product, right? You just have to govern it. Video games is used on Catholic Twitter, usually univocally. Oh, that's just always for porn addicted young men that that don't have a real job and live in their mom's basement. Or, or you can have seven kids put in a good day's work, homeschool, you know, have worked out an hour that day, um, spent time with the wife, gone out on a, what we'll go do. My wife and I will go out on a date once a week. Then we get home and we play video games with the kids before they go to bed. Like a lot of this stuff is more gray. Um, technologically, not the moral truths. That's always black and white, but, but the technologies themselves. Yeah. I was going to make a similar point, which is that you'll see some people say, I'm not going to have a smartphone. I'm not going to have a telly. I'm not even have a computer. I think it's actually more impressive to have those things, which have got the potential to be used well and do mm -hmm. lots of good and to be dominant over them, have the strength to control them properly. So I've got all the social media apps and I tried to use them for good things. And that's better than just deleting them all and never trying to reach people through them. So technology itself isn't an evil thing, but sure, it can be perverted like anything else good. But ultimately, it's an expression of the fact that we're rational and people need to just use it rationally. It's like the impulse to eat, for example, is pleasurable, but can it get disordered? Sure. And fasting is a good thing, like Tim said, and you apply that same discipline to technology too. Yeah, excellent. excellent. Well, yeah, on that point, I, I've I've made this point so many different times with regard to the question. People will ask me because I'm a YouTube Catholic influencer. Are you going to join other Catholic YouTube influencers? I don't like doing the subtweeting thing, so I'll just say it's it's Matt Frad. We'll do. I remember he came out with a an excellent little handy primer, beginner's primer on Aristotle, which is cool. And Aristotle is all about the natural virtues, namely temperance, which is precisely what you just described there, Will, having the iPhone, having the apps, and using them temperately. Now, Jesus says, if you can't be temperate, if this is too tall in order, then cut off your whole hand. You know, better better to, okay, you will, you'll get to heaven, you won't have developed the temperance muscle, but and you won't have your right hand, but you'll get to heaven. I understand that, but the the big popular fasts or or total not even fast the total severance disseverance that people will follow their favorite Catholic YouTuber on. Oh, I got rid of this for Lent. I got rid of that for Lent. It's like just have your iPhone and take it for what it is. It's not that cool. Like I'd I leave it upstairs when I'm playing games with my family after dinner. It's good to leave it upstairs. That's not a total disseverance of the hand. I'm also building temperance. Yeah, if you're a fiend that can't not look at porn or even just not look at Twitter for you know five minutes at a time, definitely get rid of it. But 
ideally develop temperance, have the thing, and just leave it plugged into the wall, like Elliot said. And I'm not saying that that that's what Matt Frad is. He, he's not. He's not. You know, attempting to intone the worst form of this, like I just said. But I would say temperance is better if you're not in a position of addiction. That's nice. Yeah, all all excellent points. I really don't have much more to add than that. Other than yeah, I think this this theme of appropriate technology is really the the uh, the theme to to look at. Yeah, and is it, if it can serve you, then great. If it can serve the Lord, then great. If it can serve evangelization or learning more about your faith, great. If it's pernicious, then yeah, yeah, then that's something to to um to guard against. Um, but that being said, I personally. I'm grateful right now for these technologies, for being able to have this really cool chat, you know, across, across the world, across the webs to, you know, anybody listening and anyone that watches us afterwards. Uh, so I think this is a hopefully a, a good use of technology over this last hour. I at least think so. So thank you all, gentlemen. Thank you, audience, for uh, checking this out. And uh, God bless. And we'll catch you next week. Take care. Take care, everyone.